Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hi, we have one of our special guests with us today, Herbie J. Pilato. How are you doing, Herbie? I'm great. I'm great, Art. How are you guys? Good. Herbie J., it's good to see you again. Now, we're, we know you as a television executive, a producer, a writer, author of many books on television, and, uh, and even the host of your own talk show, then again with Herbie J. Pilato. But... I know, because I've read some of your stuff, I know that you have blogged, and maybe that's not the right word, but you've written about your relationship with your parents. So you were, you had moved from where you grew up in uh, western New York, uh, up to what I called upstate New York, and uh, moved to Hollywood. You became very successful hobnobbing with all the celebrities that you, you grew up with on television as a kid. Yeah. And then at some point, uh, you left to go back to take care of your aged parents. That's what we're interested in today. This is a, a story that, quite frankly, hits a lot of people. Um, you know, you get to a certain age and you are, you have to take care of your parents. You, the child becomes the parent, if you will. Yeah. And it's a very, very difficult thing for so many people. But you told this story uh, on the blog that I read with great love and affection. And and that's what we want you to share with our readers today because it's a it's a great lesson in love. So when my first question is when did this happen to you? How old were you? What what, what were you doing? Well, it was really over many years. Um, I would say I originally moved formally moved to Los Angeles in uh, the fall of 83. And then, you know, I visited my parents in Rochester over Christmas and the holidays through those years up until 1989. But really, 1989, I, you know, nothing was really happening for me in L.A. I was singing, and I was dancing, I was writing. I met Elizabeth Montgomery from my, my Bewitched book, but everything was kind of like stalled. So by that time, my parents had, you know, were pretty much elderly, you know, in their 70s and their 80s. And I thought, well, why don't I just go back to Rochester? I'll finish writing the the Bewitched book, and you know, then I could I could you know relive my childhood. And as a writer, things like that, you know, are very inspirational. And that's how and that's how it happened. But I then would go I, from '89 to like 2008, when my mom passed away. My dad passed away in '95. So from '89 to 2008, in that period, I still went back and forth. Um, for certain times to Los Angeles and uh, either to work on the Bewitched feature film as a consultant or for Bravo and just, it was just constant traveling. Uh, but I always went back to my, to my parents, always. Look, they didn't, it's not like I did what I did because they had this amazing estate that I was going to inherit or, or any of that. They had nothing. My parents, all they, they were hardworking people. My dad, you know, worked in a, uh, a paper factory in Rochester, New York. My mom worked for Kodak for like 17 years. And of course, Rochester is Kodak country. But she just uh, worked one or two years shy of getting any kind of pension. So they were ultimately uneducated. And they never thought about the future because they never had to. Because they had big families and they just figured that everybody was going to be alive for the rest of their lives and everybody's going to be just fine. So they didn't think about the future. And, and, and I don't blame them for that. But Well, that, that's not uncommon, is it? I mean, that's what most no. people, quite frankly, most people do. Right, from, right. From, from their generation, for sure. Right. Like when, when I was growing up, uh, we were still up until, uh, well, we got married and we were probably the first generation that began to move away, if you will, uh, not just be in the neighborhood. Uh, 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 so, uh, I remember growing up, uh, we were in neighborhoods where all the families were sort of like next door neighbors and uh, everybody was close and there was always somebody to fill in and do. And now people, uh, are dispersed, uh, uh, a hundred, 200, 300, um, uh, 3000 miles away as, as you were uh, from your family. But so you, um, this wasn't a sudden thing where you just jumped up and, and you went and you uh, took care of them. Over a period of time, you were constantly going back and forth between uh, uh, the West Coast and the East Coast. 
But when when did uh, it become a point where you had to take more control over day to day things? Because that that was a that was a, a pretty significant thing that uh, uh, you got involved with. Yeah, yeah, I was, and I was compelled to do it the whole time. That really happened when my dad got sick in 1994, and he was diagnosed with with cancer. He started coughing, um, and he was always healthy, always robust. He smoked. But then he stopped for like the last 10 years of his life because I made him. Because, uh, you know, I'd come home and there'd be smoke in the room. But ultimately, that smoking still weakened his, his immune system, weakened his lungs, and he was diagnosed with lung cancer. I'll never forget, went to the doctor with him. The doctor showed me the, the x-rays, and there was this, you know, just horrible lump in his throat. We never really acknowledged any of that to my father, and it's not as though he didn't know he was sick. But we thought that if we just kept that diagnosis from him, it would have helped. So that would have helped him stay alive, stay alive longer, and I think it did. So that's really when it started. And so he, he had that. He suffered that last 18 months, and then he died in the spring of 95, really a month before Elizabeth Montgomery died. So that was a very tough period all the way around for me. Um, and then my mom, who was so dependent on him, because she, again, she came from that generation. She didn't drive, you know. She was the uh, the the home engineer, the housewife, which was fine. But that she was not an independent person, and I just couldn't leave her. I just couldn't, you know. I I, I had other things to do, and I certainly had my career to pursue. But I never felt that if I gave those things up, that God or the universe was going to abandon me. Uh, or my goals. I knew that one day um, I would still be everything that God wanted me to be um, and that I would be a better person in having cared for my parents. And I think I did become that. So so that's when it started. And then uh, when, when he died, you know, I just couldn't leave her. And I tried to bring her at one point to, LA, to, to Los Angeles, but that was a disaster, a total disaster to bring this, you know, a 75-year-old woman who had lived her life in Rochester in a small town to L.A. I didn't really want to live in L.A. So, you know, bringing my poor mom there. So that was horrible. And my sister helped, you know, tremendously, too. She had her son and her family. I was single, so I had more time. I was more flexible. But she certainly did. Uh, she filled in the gaps for me in, in so many countless ways. But I could not really move on with my life. I just couldn't. Uh, and people would say to me, Herbie, when are you going to get married? Herbie J., what are you doing playing with cards with your mother? I, mean, I knew what I was doing, you know. And, and you know, and I just said, yeah, okay. Well, you worry about your life. And I didn't say that to them, but in my mind I said that to them. And I did what I had to do. Because I was trying to hold on to the remnants that were left of my parents' family. Because both of them had ten brothers and sisters. And all of those people were gone. All of her sisters and brothers were gone. My dad's sisters and brothers were mostly gone. All the cousins were gone. We used to have a party every night at our house on Erie Street in Rochester. So I tried to rebuild her life with new friends in her apartment complex. Mm -hmm. I became the activities director for the apartment complex that I ultimately moved into. And those people became her friends and ultimately mine. It was really kind of magical, really. Now you were, you did move in with her, and she was in relatively good health at that time. Am I correct? She was. I I moved. Well, originally we were in. We went from Erie Street in the city, and then we left Erie Street in like '77 and went to Greenleaf Meadows in Greece, which was a suburb of Rochester. And then uh, I moved to LA in uh, uh, in one of the formal times after my my dad died in '90. Five, and then I tried to bring my mom to, to uh, L.A., and that was horrible. So we brought her back to Rochester, and then she moved to Arundacoit, which was another suburb of Rochester, which was closer to my sister. And I stayed in L.A. And then I just felt I was drawn back again to Rochester. So I ultimately did come back to Rochester in 99. Now, you put your career on hold, I take it, uh, effectively put it on hold, even though you're a writer and you could be writing from, you know, Syracuse or any place else. 
Yeah. I, I put my my life on hold more than my career because I, I kind of reinvented myself. You know, I I always wanted to be a TV star and or, or whatnot or be on TV. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I really started focusing more on the writing, saying, well, if I can't be on TV, I may as well write about uh, other people who were or write books mm -hmm. about TV shows, which I ultimately did, you know, uh, with the Bewitched Book and others. So, yeah. And then I started producing, you know, we did a, I did a, my first documentary in 99 in L.A. on Bewitched and then I became a producer. And then I ended up producing a Twilight Zone or a biography on Rod Serling for the Sci-Fi Channel, which never aired it. It's called for a series called Sciography. And I did that because I was in Rochester in my little apartment in Rochester and um, Rod Serling, his family, he was from Binghamton. So they said, Herbie, since you're in Rochester, why don't you do this? And that's how that happened. Mm -hmm. So along the way, I was always taken care of one way or the other and i still remained current in the industry but my life because it wasn't a lot of money here okay there wasn't a lot of money involved so my life was on hold i couldn't go out i couldn't you know uh, go out and with my friends or even date or I, you know i had to have my sister a uh, co-sign for a car it was just very very tough but yet there was this piece that i'm doing the right thing and it, it really came into, hit me on the head, really, when um, this, I, I got an apartment close to my mom, and uh, the phone man came, and I, and I, I wrote about this on Medium, which is medium.com, which is where my blog is, and this phone man, you know, back in the, let's see, it was like 2001 or something, so they were still putting regular phones in, which they still do today, but not as much. So the phone man came. So he says to me, the phone man, he looks at me and I'm like pondering what, you know, what's going on in my life? What am I doing? Living up the street from my mom. I'm, you know, whatever I was, 48 years old, you know, stagnant. And so this phone man who happened to be Jehovah, Jehovah Witness, which is no big deal to me. I have no issues with anybody's religion as long as they talk about love. And he starts talking, he goes, what are you what are you looking for and i did want to you know like you talking to me <laughs> i go what do you mean he goes well it looks like you're searching i go well to tell you the truth it says i'm upset i've got all this talent and i can sing i can dance i can write but here i am you know caring for my mother back in rochester new york all my friends have moved on with their lives he goes you don't get it i says what do you mean he says you're talking about your talents singing and dancing and writing but your your best talents and your 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 most quality of talents are your compassion and your kindness and you know your your ability to communicate he says you're talking to me right now like we've known each other our whole lives do you know what a gift that is <laughs> and i i just was stunned i never saw my compassion or my kindness as a talent. And he changed my life, that phone man. Never saw him again, but changed my life. And that's when I knew I'm not going anywhere. So you, know? so you are now uh, a, uh, you haven't come back to LA uh, to live again. You're, no. you're, you're a nor'easter. Yes. Is that right, nor'easter? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I traveled like a, a, for a months at a time to work on, like I said, the Bewitched movie, a Bravo show that I did where I was a producer, 100 Greatest TV Characters. Um, but I was set in stone in Rochester and caring for my mom and organizing um, Valentine's parties, Christmas parties, Thanksgiving parties, Easter parties, uh, J July 4th parties, Friday night parties, card games, pizza parties. Whatever it was that I could do to keep everybody in that complex over my mother's house to give her a family, uh, it was it was amazing. Because I, the the people who ran the complex even allowed me to like use the clubhouse whenever I wanted. <laughs> Just as long as you'd show up with a party. Just as long as I showed up with a party 
and they even helped budget wise. They'd even help help pay for some of the, you know, the the food. And it was it was really wonderful, and I really enjoyed it, um, just as much as my mom, if not more, sometimes because she yeah. had been, he, she had dementia at, in the end. Mm. You know, that's, so she, that's that's the point I wanted to ask about. Besides being social director, there had to be a point at which she started declining in her health. And yeah. did you, at that point, did you find that to be a burden? Because you obviously enjoyed what you were doing. You, you saw a higher reason for it. You were willing to sacrifice, you know, a certain amount of your career. But did you see it as a burden as well? Because it's a difficult thing to go through. It was becoming tough when she was having issues with, um, you know, um, her digestive system and she, she constantly had to be changed like a baby, you know, because of her the adult diapers and that whole thing. That was really, really, really tough. I um, mean, I was like almost changing her every other, you know, two or three hours. So we had made a decision to bring to to bring her to a different facility, where they she would have twenty four hour care. And as I look back, I wish I would not have done that. But oh, I really? thought, yes, I thought it was the right decision, but it was not. And Why? it was um, because the the facility was I ended when I lived next to my mom in her apartment in Arundacoit, the first one. All I had to do was go across the way, you know, to visit her. So, and we had at home aides who also helped. But if I needed to go there, I was over there. When we brought her to the new facility, I moved on to another apartment on, on the other side of town thinking, well, my mom is going to be cared for now. So maybe I can have a little bit of, of a life. You know, she's going to have 24 hour care. But I was still compelled to see her. So instead of going across the lawn, from the south apartments to the north apartments in Arundaquay, I ended up driving 10 miles every day that I, to see her. And it, it was just tr horrible. It was just horrible. And the surroundings, when you have d dementia and you move someone with dementia, they don't, it, it throws them. It throws them off. So ultimately, uh, I, I wish, and she only lived a, a couple more months after moving. Uh, which I thought would have only helped her more to move, but it didn't. So she probably just would have been fine and passed away in her apartment that she was familiar with. So it was that was hard. And when she died, it was bad. I would visit her. Uh, I visited her that Friday, and I would leave her. And I would leave her at night. I go, Mom, I'm going to go now, but the aide is going to be here to take care of you. And she says, oh, you're going to go. And I'm probably going to die. I says, Mom, you're not going to die. I'll call you when I get home and the, and the aide will be here. Well, I got home and she called me. She called me all the time. And she said, Herbert, are you going to come back? Are you going to come back and see me? I says, Mom, no, no, the aide's, I told you, the aide's going to be there. Well, I hung up and I had a dream. And it was me and my mother on this beautiful shore, in this ocean shore, and there were these crystal waves. And the one big, huge crystal wave was coming toward us as we're sitting, standing on the shore. And I walked through the wave, and I turned to see if my mother was coming with me, and she stayed on shore. The phone rang. I, I awakened from my dream. And it was the nurse, Herbie, your mother, we found her on the floor. She's, she's still breathing, but you have to come as soon as you can. So I drove 10 miles through red lights in the middle of the night, 3 a.m., whatever it was, and I didn't make it. And it was horrible. But I think that was God's way of saying that if I stayed with her that night, I would have seen her die. And I think God was protecting me. And I think my mother in her heart of hearts, in her soul of souls, knew that I was going to be okay. She, I, here I was worried about leaving her, but I think she was worried about 
would, would her BJ be okay if I leave this world? When she saw that I at least got my other apartment and she, and, and her soul now, not her mind, but her soul, I felt, knew that she could not go on the way she was going, she left. Um, but of course I carried guilt no matter what I did for her and my dad in those 13 years before, um, leaving her that night, I had guilt uh, for for quite some time after, um, you know, especially if she said, I'm probably going to die tonight. That's what she said. Well, you know, uh, Herbie, um, the, we were looking forward to having this conversation because so many people are uh, uh, facing this kind of thing and whether their parents go to an assisted living uh, uh, situation or whether they are at home and uh, uh, under hospice care or whatever it happens to be for long periods of time, for short periods of time, uh, we all have to uh, face this at some point with, with aging parents. And the bottom line is that the message that we're getting from you with all the pluses and minuses that uh, uh, getting into a position where you're able uh, to help care for aging parents is something that uh, while there were the, the, the high points and the low points, it's uh, something you wouldn't have traded. No, I, I, I loved my parents. I, I took care of them because I loved them, not because I was, again, seeking some massive estate. They had no estate. <laughs> you know, it would have been nice if I could have got a, a million dollars, you know, in, in inheritance, but that didn't happen. And that's not why I did it. Um, and let me say that the reason in the, the reason it, that particular new facility didn't work for her wasn't because the facility was not great. It was terrific, but it just wasn't for her at that time. And if there's any advice that I could give to anyone who is being a caregiver right now with an elderly parent or an elderly aunt or whatever, um, if they're still living in their home that they've known their whole life, and if they're no longer capable of living there, and if they're no longer capable of making their own decisions, which more times than not, they're not, you have to take the bull by the horns and say, look it, you can't live here anymore. They're no longer in a position to make decisions for themselves. We have to start thinking about how to make your life better, your quality of life. Because if you don't start thinking about that now, then what's going to happen, that person is going to die and suddenly for one reason or another and you're going to be left uh, and the people involved responsible for that person are going to be left with so many other responsibilities that could have easily been alleviated or lessened if they would have taken uh, care of the situation while that person was alive and that person could have had something to say in the decisions of who's going to get this who's going to get that where do, who do we give this old table to aunt cranny whatever those, if you do that now, and I know it's difficult to leave the old homestead, believe me, but if you do those things now in a calm manner, that relieves so much stress later on than instead of just having someone suddenly die and then you're stuck with, oh, God, what do we do now? Yeah. Uh, Herbie, really appreciate you sharing this story because it is so universal. Uh, and, and we all... You know, to take care of an aged parent, it's just a, it's a, what do you call it? A, a life experience that most of us never want to have to go through, but we all have to go through. Yeah. And, and again, I'll never, ever regret one second of it. It was, I became a nicer person. I was always a nice guy. Oh, you're a but, nice guy. <laughs> but... <laughs> um, but I think I became a, a, a nicer guy. And my dad, I'll never forget, I was there for my dad when he died, but I wasn't there for my mom. You were. And, you were. Uh, you were. Yes. I, I know that now. But it, it, it was more affirming with my dad. My dad was breathing heavily, going through all that horrible thing that everybody does. You know, it's something not everybody does, but the sickly do in the end. And um, I had a, a TV show or a radio show that I was supposed to do. So I was, he was panting and panting and panting. And I was like, okay, dad, what's going on here? You know, uh, are you going to be okay? Are you going to make this through or, or what? So he's not conscious. He's just breathing heavily. So finally, 
his eyes open. He looks at me, smiles. I had to get something like for the radio show that I was going to do. And in the table next to me, I came back to him and he was gone. He was gone. And an hour before that, my mother was visiting with him at the hospital and she's calling me into her, into the hospital room. And I'm on the phone doing with something, you know, with the radio or whatever. Again, he goes, Herbert, you, Herbert, you, come here, come here. So, well, I can't, my, I can't. Well, apparently my father had some kind of vision of heaven because he had opened his eyes then too. So there were two different times where he opened his eyes over a period where he had not opened his eyes. He was doing the panting. And that was with his, my mom, and that was with me in his last breath. Yeah. I'll never forget his face. He had this angelic smile on his face, like, thank you. You know, that's what I took it as. I went to get a piece of paper, and he was gone. That, unfortunately, kind of thing did not happen with my mom, where I got to say goodbye. I, I just didn't get to say goodbye. Well, Herbie J., uh, this has been uh, great. Thank you for sharing. It's painful. But it's also um, revealing and, and uh, inspiring, I might uh, add, uh, because you did do the right thing. You knew you were doing the right thing. And ultimately, you did do the right thing. So everybody, everybody has their own path. You know, I was free to do it because I was single and, you know, I didn't have a family. But there are still people who do have families and who still do that. And they're all amazing. Anyone who care gives for any a parent or a child or whatever. It's a tremendous full-time job. And um, it's the most rewarding job I've ever had. Well, we're going we're gonna to leave it here on a little up upbeat note. And we're looking forward to getting together with you again on perhaps a much more upbeat subject. But this certainly was a necessary one. And we thank you for uh, sharing a very personal uh, journey in a very public way, and I, we know it will help a lot of our uh, audience. Thank you. Thank you, guys. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.